SJC 11769, Commonwealth versus Lucas Walters. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, it's my privilege to represent Lucas Walters in this matter. I'm William Smith. Um, the, the first issue, recognizing, of course, it was unpreserved, I would suggest this would come within that very narrow sort of chasm of, of, of cases where in a separate instruction um, with respect to the missing evidence uh, is, 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 is compelling. Um, I recognize, of course, the Commonwealth argues that the Bowden instruction was given. There was a Bowden instruction given. But I would suggest the model jury instruction itself tells us it is, in fact, a separate instruction. The model jury instruction, unfortunately, there is nothing in there in terms of an example of what could be given or what should well, be given. Uh, could you remind me what that in instruction would look like, please? Pardon me? What would that instruction look like? That, uh, off the top of my head, I, I, I don't think I could recite it, but I think the essential element would be that it would tell the jury, well, they're not compelled, I'm not suggesting they would be compelled to draw a negative inference against the Commonwealth, but they could if they so found. In other words, they could draw the inference that had that evidence come in, it may have been hurtful vis-a-vis -vis the Commonwealth's case. How does Bowdoin not take care of that, particularly in, that, in uh, connection with a substantial likelihood of a, of a miscarriage of justice? Well, I would suggest, Your Honor, Bowdoin goes to investigative techniques or lack of scientific testing. And it speaks very generally. It does not address the issue of when there's missing evidence. I mean, it talks about the police. Yeah, they, presumptively missing evidence. It might be missing. It might not be, right? I mean, well, know, the, in, evidence was, uh, the evidence was both ways on that one, right? In, in, in many cases, I would suggest it would. Uh, but this is not such a case. I mean, there was a search warrant was executed. The search warrant affidavits mentioned a rake. They mentioned the statements that my client had made with respect to what had happened. Um, and then the warrant itself listed the rake. And then the police went and they executed the warrant. They, they secured the perimeter around the crime scene. So I would suggest that in every way, shape, or form that the evidence was, in fact, in the possession, custody, or control so of the Tell me what difference it makes, though. I don't understand. I mean, everybody knows what a rake looks like, right? Well, it could. Why, does it, why do you have to have the physical rake? Because it could have been tested uh, for DNA, could have been tested for blood. Um, my client gave the, told the police that what had happened was he was attacked with the rake. He said that the rake injured his legs. Well, we know what kind of injury was on his legs, right? Well, they, there was. How there, bad an injury was that? There were photographs. The police did not take photographs, interestingly enough, but there were photographs taken, I believe, at the, at the jail. Of the leg? Correct. And the, the prosecutor argued essentially that there was no actual evidence that, that, that this had happened with the rake or tried to dismiss it by saying, well, it was, it, it was from thorn bushes where the, where the gentleman's body was, was, was taken. Are the pictures in the record? I, I believe they are, Your Honor. Um, so, I mean, given that fact, that this was the linchpin of the defendant's case. What, self-defense? Self-defense, Your Honor, and mitigation as well. So, so I would suggest the jury may well have thought, well, we have his statement, right? We have his statement where he said that this had happened, but that's all we have. And had that evidence, it had been seized, had it been collected and tested, um, the jury may very well have not believed that. I mean, they may very well have thought, well, it's not, we're not really convinced there's self-defense here, but it does seem that there's mitigation here to manslaughter. And I would suggest this is a case that could have gone either way in that regard. Maybe, maybe it was a stronger case for manslaughter rather than self-defense. But the fact of the matter is, had the jury been instructed that they could consider the lack of that evidence, that, that because the evidence was missing, I mean, you could look at it as lost or destroyed. I would suggest it would come under the ambit of lost. Um, but in any event, they never, they never heard that. Um, Never asked for it either, did they? Pardon me? Did they ask for it? The defendant, did the, the defendant never asked for it, though. Did he, did he ask for a lost evidence instruction? Oh, correct, Your Honor. No, he did not. Right. He did not. I mean, he, he asked for a um, Bowden instruction. I believe the Commonwealth objected to that, but the Bowden instruction was given. Right. So I would suggest the judge was conscientious here. The 
defense counsel, I mean, was conscientious, but I would suggest it, it is there in the model instructions. It references the fact that there may very well be cases where it, such an instruction is, is, uh, is warranted or should be given, and it was not. Um, again, in fairness, there is no, that I could find, there is no separate instruction in the model instructions on it, but it is referenced, I believe, in the, in the Bowden instruction um, itself. Sorry, you say model instruction, that's not in the model homicide instructions. Are you referring to the, to the, uh, the so-called model instructions which are furnished to judges and attorneys prepared by, uh, uh, Try and think of the organization, but the MCLE. The, 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 the MCLE. No, it's. If I could have one moment. Or is it a district court model it's, instruction? It's Massachusetts model jury instructions three point seven four zero note three. Okay, but is it is it a, a district court model instruction or is it an MCLE instruction? I'm trying to think what you That's, what you say to be a model instruction. I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure, but it is there in those model instructions. It may not be the homicide instruction but it is there. And so he didn't ask for it. He, he asked for a Bowdoin instruction, which the judge was not required to give, but which the judge gave. Uh, your, the, the attorney argued it, I guess, throughout the throughout cross-examination and, and in closing. He did. And he did. so you'd have to prove to us or show us that there was a substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice arising from the failure of or the absence of such an instruction given to the jury. Well, why, when the attorney is arguing it, and again, we don't require Bowdoin, we say it's part of argument, why is this not appropriately the stuff of argument as opposed to something which a judge is obliged to instruct upon? I would suggest respectfully it's the, it's the subject of both. It's the subject of argument properly, it's the subject of an instruction properly. I mean, the fact is the jury, the jury is instructed that they're to consider the evidence and only the evidence. Well, how does the jury really know how they're supposed to deal with something that is sort of non-evidence? I mean, that's what this principle is. Um, it certainly exists as well as a separate principle in terms of it could be grounds for dismissal. I mean, it's, I think dismissal is, is deemed to be in the case law a, a sort of draconian remedy that would be reserved for only the, the, the smallest number of cases. But certainly, uh, the, the, the case law speaks of it being a remedy. I think the case law takes it very seriously. Um, I understand that the case law says on about an instruction that it's left to the sound discretion of the trial judge. But I would suggest that this type of instruction actually, although it's similar to Bowden, you could look at it sort of in that way, um, but it's actually quite different. And because the, the, the fact is it, it's not evidence. It's, I mean, what is the jury really to do with that? The jurors could deliberate and they could say, well, as to that rake, I mean, the judge instructed us we're to consider the evidence and only the evidence, and there was no evidence of a rake. There was no evidence of it did, introduced. Did Malloy fill out the search warrant, or is he just one of the people, one of the officers who came out and executed it? He, he was involved in the execution. No, I, but did he, I mean, was he the officer who actually, I mean, Three officers didn't see, did not see a rake, right? One officer said he saw a rake. Um, you say that it would be significant to him. Did, I'm just curious whether Malloy prepared the search warrant or not. Well, regardless, Your Honor, I, I believe I cited this in it's the- just, It's a question, it's a fact question. Did he or didn't he? Did, did, did Malloy prepare the search warrant? I believe he did. I could be mistaken it, on that. I, I don't. I, I was looking for the search warrant. Is it in the record? I believe so. Okay. Um, <laughs> Trooper Tobin, regardless, Trooper Tobin testified. He was asked a question, and as you indicated, at that point you knew that there had been a statement about a rake. You felt you would have liked to have found that rake, correct? Answer: Yes. Question: Because that could have been very important in corroborating Mr. Walter's statements, statement about being struck and that's why he exploded, correct? Answer, he mentioned a rake. We wanted to find a rake. We meaning the police. Um, question, but he didn't just mention a rake. He said he was struck with a rake, got cut with a rake, and that's why he committed this crime, right? Answer, what I remember him telling me was that he got struck by a rake and then he did something else. And then uh, defense counsel went on, refreshed his recollection in terms of 
the affidavit he had prepared that also mentioned the rape. So uh, the Commonwealth, it seems to me in their brief, relied on uh, Detective Malloy. They may be correct on that, but frankly, with all due respect, it doesn't matter. There was ample evidence, not only that the police knew about the rake, but that they had already attached significance to the rake at the time they searched. But I had thought the evidence was that they, it, with, it, within the shed, that they didn't find a rake, correct? There was some testimony to that effect, but there was also testimony that there were multiple rakes. I, I mean, any one of which, including the one that and the, and the shed was destroyed by um, the father of the victim, right? I believe that was the evidence that essentially right. then it was. Right after the crime. It, which, is, which is his right, no question. But the fact of the matter is the police had secured the, the area and they never um, procured the rape. So, so I'm is, not is, asking. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, is your focus on the rake, the, the rake that Malloy found outside the shed? which was a plastic rake? Is that what you say was so significant? Or are you saying that there was a metal rake which was inside the shed, which they did not examine or seize? Well, it's the lack of the rake that is more significant, I would suggest. There, were, there was testimony, at least some testimony, that there were multiple such implements present. I mean, it could have been a landscaping <coughs> rake, for instance. We don't know. I mean, the idea that it was limited to a um, leaf rake it's simply, it's conjecture. We don't know that. It could have been a landscaping rake. Even if it was a leaf rake, the fact of the matter is it's but, what- But Malloy more... only identifies a plastic rake, right? Malloy, the, the rake that Malloy remembers is a plastic rake. I believe so, that, yes. The other three officers don't remember seeing any rake. But so, they so the only rake that could possibly meet the definition you're talking about is the plastic rake. There may be Bowden instruction on the other possible rakes, but the destroyed evidence, in your theory, only would apply to a plastic rake, wouldn't it? But there was evidence that there were other rakes present as but well, that's, so we that, just But that don't doesn't know. justify a destroyed, uh, a destruction of evidence instruction, right? I believe it would. I mean, if How that rake, if the plastic one had been tested, I, I probably would be wrong, but it wasn't. None of them were. You, 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 you've got two different issues, one about destroying evidence and another about not finding evidence, right? Um, and not finding is a Bowdoin issue, destroying is the other issue. The it, only evidence that you even arguably destroyed is the plastic rake. Well, it's missing evidence. I mean, the, the, the instruction that I cited, but also more importantly, the case law, doesn't draw that distinction with all due respect, Your Honor. It speaks of missing evidence. Um, if it's not in the possession, custody, or control of the police, well, that's a different story. They have no obligation to, you know, go out there and find every single piece of evidence. But the fact of the matter is, on these facts, they had, they had executed a search warrant. They had secured the perimeter of the area, and they did not do, they did not take the rakes. So they had possession, c custody, control of them, but they didn't take them. So why is the Bowden instruction not adequate? Because it does not focus on the fact that the jury can draw an inference, they're not compelled to, but that they can draw an inference with respect to evidence that is missing. And I would suggest that's why it is referenced as a separate instruction in those model instructions, albeit not homicide, but they're there. And it's there in the case law. I cited multiple cases that suggest that there may be instances where that such an instruction as this should be given. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not something that I'm just sort of creating at the top of my head. It is in the case law. Was it argued at closing? I'm sorry, Was Your it Honor? argued at closing by defense counsel? The, yes, Your Honor. I mean, factually it was argued, no question about it. But again, I go back to the jury was also instructed that they are to consider the evidence and only the evidence. So I, I think any reasonable jury could go back, deliberate, and say, one juror might say, well, but what about this whole thing about the rake? And another juror could say, it's, it's rough, but it, there's nothing there. It was not in the evidence. It, it was never introduced. No, um, they would have seen the scratch marks or anything, right? I'm sorry, Your Honor? They would have seen the wounds on his legs, right? They were either consistent with scratch marks or they weren't, right? Well, the, the jury saw, the, I'm sorry, the jury saw. Weren't there pictures of the defendant's leg? Yes, yes, Your Honor. So they would have seen what they looked like, right? 
Correct, but but the process. You're saying, the, you can't, and you, you're saying it because he says it was self-defense, and you say there's nothing to tie the rake because you don't have the rake. You can't tie it with DNA. That's that's correct. your argument. Correct. And, well, and, and what difference that makes? What difference? Because the, the that, prosecutor, Your Honor, his, the prosecutor argued that those scratches came from the land. There was a wooded area where the gentleman's body was was left, right. and the prosecution said. Those scratches, that's where that came from because there were rose bushes. There was even some testimony um, when the police went there with my client. He showed them the area, brought them to the area, and there was some testimony that they had gone through some sort of a briar patch. Do we know anything about the depth of these scratches? I'm sorry about the scratches look like. Well, how big were the scratches? Were the scratches deep? Or was the, the I mean, it's, it's there in the photograph. I, 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 again, it was. And the jury saw the photograph. Correct. But again, the jury may have thought that that came from the briar patches. That was the Commonwealth's theory. Could have been too, right? It could have been, but we just don't. I mean, but it also could have been that that those were scratches. So I mean, even if you take him at his word that he he got it um, from the uh, defendant from the victim in his rake, so what? So what? So what? Mm. Well, so what is the fact that it would have it, there could have been DNA on there? There could have been. Yeah, but blood I mean, so what? I mean, so what? So what? You're saying that there was no that was that was the only basis for self defense? No, and that's why I said earlier. I mean, it might be the so what could be a mitigation to manslaughter. I would suggest that's not really a so what, <laughs> Your Honor. It's it's because the jury may have thought it was, was it would have to believe it was self defense. The, the jury on these facts may have completely disbelieved. They could have said, "Well, we, all we have is the statement on that," and they could have thought, "Well, you know, we, we have his statement. That's it." There's nothing really solid relative to a rake. Um, and if maybe if we had something more concrete, we wouldn't have exonerated him, but we would have found that this was mitigation to manslaughter because it was imperfect self-defense or because it was mutual combat. It was sudden provocation. And bang, there it is. There's the blood. There's the DNA evidence. It's right there on the rake. That's the, the so what. Okay. Can you Are you talking about an intoxication, please? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, relative to the prosecutor's argument, Your Honor, is that yeah. okay? So the what evidence was there of intoxication by the defendant? Or, or was the victim also intoxicated? What kind of what kind of evidence was there of intoxication by either of them? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, the I mean the the statement, the, the video statement of my client um, shows he was he he explained he was it was a mixture of drugs, uh, alcohol. There was some indication that there were drugs in the gentleman who, who was killed. There, there were in, in his bloodstream as well. I believe it was not tested for cocaine. But um, certainly it's in his statement. It, there's a plethora of it in his statement. So there certainly was evidence as to intoxication. So the Commonwealth then, and I would suggest that it's controlled by Salazar in this regard, um, a 2018 case from, from this court. Um, the Commonwealth repeatedly used the word excuse. It's not the word excuse in and of itself that's problematic, but they did it in a context where they were saying, essentially, um, telling the jury that this whole defense was based on excuse um, and, and intoxication being an excuse, which of course is not a defense. So what Salazar said uh, was that the, it was error, that the prosecutor should not say that. Because the problem is, you know, it portrays this whole thing as the defendant arguing, well, I was drunk, I was, I was high, I was on all sorts of drugs, so therefore I am legally excused, um, which of course is not the case. And no such argument here was made by the defense. The defense argued he could not form the requisite intent as to either theory of murder. Judge instructed on the effects of drugs and alcohol, right? Yes, correct. But what Salazar tells us is that's, is that's the problem. Then you have the conflicting uh, sort of legal, legal premise, for lack of a better term, from the prosecutor. So Salazar says this, I would suggest, says this is error. But in Salazar, the court, this court noted it was um, a, a fleeting reference. It was a single reference. Well, here it was used multiple times. But um, I believe but Salazar as well. It was not prejudicial in the context of the evidence of the case here. I mean, uh, that that was that was a linchpin of the defense case. There was no objections, right? 
I, it's, it's a, I would suggest it's unclear from the record, but I would suggest even if it's viewed under the more onerous standard that that still, it goes to the heart of the defendant's case. Um, and I think Salazar, uh, you know, expressly sets forth wh why that's so problematic. I see my time is up if there's anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Elford. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. Pamela Alford for the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth today is asking this court to affirm the convictions of first degree murder, breaking and entering in the daytime, and larceny from a building for can you put, the. Can you uh, put the microphone a little closer to you? Thanks for the murder of Jeffrey Phillips. I'd like to start with the issue of the rake and I'd like to um, discuss the, the factual circumstances of the rake because I think they're really important in this particular case. So on Wednesday, July 29th, the Braintree police are engaged in a missing persons investigation. And around 7 p.m., uh, Detective Thomas Malloy, with two of our officers, is at 391 Middle Street, where both the victim and the defendant lived in separate apartments, and they're conducting a canvas. Meanwhile, the defendant is going to Bra the Braintree Police Station to announce that he killed the victim. Um, the uh, Detective Malloy and other officers are called back. Um, one officer, Detective Corzoli, along with Sergeant Cahoon and eventually a Massachusetts State Police Trooper, conduct an interview of the defendant. Meanwhile, the de de Detective Malloy is sent back to 391 Middle Street to put up crime scene tape with, I believe, Detective Sherrick, who is, um, at that time, he's also interviewing the defendant's girlfriend. Um, and so it's Detective Malloy who's putting up crime scene tape. There is no search warrant at this point. It is not clear what they're getting from the defendant. Detective Sherrick testifies that while they're at the 391 Middle Street scene and when he later goes back to the police station, he's getting p bits and pieces from the interview. Um, so Detective Malloy at that point testifies that as he's putting up crime scene tape, he's crawling around the back of the shed and he sees the plastic leaf rake. At the time of the search warrant. This is outdoors in other words. It is outdoors. Okay, and um, he doesn't know anything at all about the defendant at this point saying that he's been attacked by a rake. Or does he? That, that's the clear inference from the evidence, that he does not know anything that the defendant was attacked from the rake at this point. He's just putting up crime scene tape. And he's seeing a rake there. He, see, he At grand jury, he testifies he sees a rake behind the shed. Not in the shed, but behind the shed on the top of some clutter. At the time of the search warrant, and I agree, to answer Justice Kafker's question, um, I don't know that the record reflects who wrote the search warrant, but I would suggest Detective Malloy was not in the interview, and at the time, what is clear from the record is at the time of the search warrant at 391 Middle Street, Detective Malloy is in Southwick, and that's something to think about here, that the defendant's interview creates multiple scenes. The defendant said that he killed the victim in the shed at 391 Middle Street, that he stole items from the victim's apartment at 391 Middle Street, that the ax, which was the omitted murder weapon, along with other implements, was in a trailer at his girlfriend's house in Southwick, Massachusetts, and that the defendant had taken the victim's body to Suffield, Connecticut. So you have uh, uh, four scenes here, and at the time of the search warrant, uh, Detective Malloy testifies he's in Southwick. He then testifies that he shortly thereafter leaves to go on vacation. He testifies at the grand jury, and it's the evidence at trial was that the rest of the Braintree Police Department did not realize that he had observed a rake till, till Detective Malloy got a subpoena from the defense counsel. Um, so there is a real, so when you look at this as a substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice standard, you have to look at why that there was no motion here. And I suggest that's really important. There are very good strategic reasons that defense counsel would not have wanted to file a motion here because if he had a pre-trial, a, a, a hearing pre-trial, they think there'd be a real question about was there, was there a rake? Um, the investigators, um, the, the officers and the investigators 
um, did not collect a rake who conducted the search warrant. There was a lot of cross-examination on John Biello, who was the chemist, who said he did go to the back about whether he didn't see a rake or he didn't recall that there was a rake or he didn't recall what was back there. If you had a pretrial hearing, um, one, you'd have a real question about, one, was there a rake? Two, if you look at um, the Commonwealth versus Wright, whether the police would have had, uh, whether Detective Malloy would have recognized the import of the rake, it's the Commonwealth's position that the, the record, that the evidence suggests that Thomas Malloy was putting up crime scene tape. He, he, he wasn't collecting anything. So that, he, that it was not aware to him, it would not have been a duty upon him to collect the rake at, at the time. I think there's also a question of materiality and, and to correct, um, to, to correct uh, a, 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 a fact, it, it was not the victim's father who destroyed the shed, it was the defendant's girlfriend's father. And I wanna be clear that there was no allegation of impropriety here. The testimony was that um, a, about a week or so after, um, after the murder, the police released the shed to the defendant's girlfriend's father. The, the girlfriend also lived at 391 Middle Street. The landlord wanted it down and he took it down and, and he had permission to, to do so. But when you're looking at a Commonwealth versus Phoenix balancing test of culpability, I, I do think there's a real question about um, when they're returning what's considered to be the, the missing evidence to parties in favor of the defendant. And so, and the defendant's girlfriend was a defense witness. The defendant's girlfriend's parents were both Commonwealth witnesses. All three, um, so, so they, they were available. You also have to look at, uh, counsel made a, a lot of, um, <laughs> there was a lot of cross-examination on, um, on the police that they didn't know there was a rake till right before the murder, I, such a counsel tried to make a lot of points off of this. There was a real strategic decision that what he had was the police didn't collect a rake and he made a lot of points off that point. He got a Bowdoin instruction over the Commonwealth's objection um, and, and I suggest made great weight of um, great work of, 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 the, of the fact that was clear from the record, which was police didn't collect a rake that one, one detective testified that he saw. And, and nothing more was required, and certainly nothing was required for the judge to sue a sponte, give an instruction um, th that wasn't requested. To answer the question about the model jury instructions, that instruction comes from the, that instruction, which is a Bowdoin instruction and a footnote um, talking about the lost and destroyed evidence instruction that comes from Commonwealth versus Phoenix, comes from the district court. Um, that's a district court model jury instruction. Okay. Um, if, I, if I can turn you back to the shed. So they get a search warrant. Yep. The search warrant affidavit makes reference to what uh, the defendant said with regard to what he claimed to be the, the provocation for the, uh, the ax killing. Uh, and they do a search of the shed. Yes. Uh, and one would think that one of the things they'd be looking for is not only the ax, uh, but also the, uh, the rake. The rake, they believe, the defendant said the ax was in an, at the Southwick location. So they would have been looking for the rake at, at the Braintree location. And the testimony does make that clear. Okay, so they're going there primarily for the purpose of looking for a rake. And is, why, is it, why is the testimony not clear as to whether or not they found a rake or the, whether or not there was a rake in the shed? I think the testimony was clear. The testimony was they did not find a rake in the shed. The testimony was they did not collect a rake. Um, the, the contrary testimony from Detective Malloy was that when he put up crime scene tape, he saw a rake at the back of the okay, shed. Okay, I understand that, but I thought your brother spoke about them seeing some metal rakes that were in the shed. Is there any testimony that anybody saw any metal rakes within the shed? I am not aware of any testimony that anybody saw metal rakes in the shed. There may have been testimony from the landlord that there were two sheds. So there was the shed we've been talking about is a shed that had a partial tarp wall that the defendant himself put up. It was the defendant's property um, that he built, put up to put snowmobiles in. 
Um, I also suggest they were going there for the search warrant, not just for the rake, but because that was the murder scene. There was a significant amount of blood evidence um, and other evidence there that, um, that, that the police were, I would think, primarily interested in. Um, there may have been... I believe that the murder took place in the, inside the shed, not outside the shed. I, and I apologize if I was, if I confused, Your Honor. Outside of the residence, there was a tarp shed. It has partial plywood walls and partial tarp. And the evidence was that the murder took place inside the tarp shed, which was outdoors. Okay. And were photographs taken of the shed? There the, were photographs the taken search? of the shed. There was no, uh, I, there, I believe exhibit 30 is the closest that they come um, and that's the side of the shed. There was no photograph taken behind the shed. And to finish answering your honor's question, the landlord did testify he had a separate shed that, that he kept landscaping tools at. That um, I would suggest there is no testimony from the defendant had anything to do with, the, with, with this offense, that, that this offense occurred because he was in his shed um, uh, I think the word was tinkering around, and he got into, he asked the, the victim for money, to borrow more money, the victim didn't want, got irritated because the defendant already owed him money, and, and that's where um, the offense took place. And, and, and indeed, blood was found in the shed that was searched? Yes, so blood, um, blood was found. There were four different, um, oh, three different swabs for which DNA was tested that came back to the victim um, in the shed. Um, uh, there was a numerous testimony and photographs about the blood stains that were found in the shed. Um, that um, there was also um, a knife. Uh, found in the shed that the Commonwealth alleged could have been used to cut the rope to bind the victim in the tarp before he was transferred to, to Suffield, Connecticut. Um, and um, all, all that came in before the jury. In addition, to answer your Honor's questions about the scratches uh, and the thorns, there was testimony of the investigators who went to the scene. There were photographs of the... Um, photographs of the area in which the, uh, the victim was recovered. And there was also a, a video that showed the path to take to, um, to, to the victim's body. In addition, if you look at the defendant's interview, um, uh, Sergeant Cahoon, when he is doing his initial pat down of, 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 of the defendant, um, notices the scratches and says to the effect of, hey, have you been walking through some, some bushes? The defendant says no. Um, and then there were pictures, as, as, as defense counsel says, um, of, of the scratches. So this was all before the jury. They had, uh, they- The question is the scratches on one leg or two legs? I, I believe both, Your Honor, but I'm not entirely clear. Right. The pictures, the, the pictures which were in evidence would- um, okay. can, I, can you address briefly the lamb warning? That shouldn't have been brought up, right? The import of the closing argument was that the def was entirely evidence-based. The import of that section of closing argument was that, the, that Dr. Ebert was basing his opinion on what the defendant told him. And by Dr. Ebert's own admission on cross-examination, what the defendant told him was far less detailed, and I suggest far less incriminatory than what he told police. Well, do, we, we, do we really want prosecutors referencing the lamb warning in their closing? Is that, is that, isn't that asking for some trouble? Regardless of whether the lamb warning itself should have been mentioned. The argument that, that the defense expert was not credible because he was relying on the defendant's statements and the defendant knew that the statements he gave to his expert were going to be used on his behalf at trial is perfectly appropriate. Um, and if you look at cases um, such as we've allowed references to lamb warnings and closings that, that the I, defendant was when he met with his expert he was warned when he was, when he met with the uh, 
the expert, he was warned that this stuff could be used against him? There's no clear case on, on point, Your Honor. The closest that I would say is, if you look at Commonwealth versus Seabrooks, what Commonwealth versus Seabrooks says is that the violation as to a land warning is when it's not given, that there is no violation when it is given. It, well, and I it, understand we want to give the land warning. That's a whole different matter than having the prosecution use it against the defendant um, in closing, isn't it? I suggest it's what the land warning stands for, which is that the defendant was not credible when he spoke to his expert because he knew those statements were going to um, be used at trial. Was it appropriate in the circumstance of this, this case where it wasn't a characterization that the defendant ha had a motive to lie, but it was based on the evidence, the admitted evidence, that the def by Dr. Ebert, that the defendant gave Dr. Ebert, which he was relying on, a far less detailed, um, a far less detailed version of the offense than he gave police. And that was entirely appropriate for cross-examination. Isn't, isn't that how we want to do this going forward? to say that rather than talk about the lamb warning? It, it go, again, it, again, going forward, again, well, it's the When we write this section of the opinion, do you want us to be encouraging prosecutors to do this again, or do you want us to say there's a simpler way to do this, which is to just say that the, the statement given to the, to the doctor was far less detailed than the statement given to the police. Uh, on the facts of this case, it's the Commonwealth's position that there, there was no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice because this was regardless of what this court may think there, about. There was no objection to the lamb warning? There reference. was not. Okay. Used to, there, that there was, that based on the facts of this case, regardless of what this court may say about the use of, of the words the lamb warning that this was an evidence-based argument that is permissible un under law. I, w I would like to turn. Um, you, along, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you on this one, but uh, along the same lines. But what do you say about the um, Salazar situation in which it was an improperly considered a misstatement of law for a prosecutor to argue that intoxication didn't excuse the defendant's actions? What about? Yes, what I do want to note that Salazar was a 2018 case, which was post-trial. Uh -huh, um, okay. But. I suggest that we look at the, the defendant's argument and what Salazar's concern was, um, and I think what cases in this vein are concerned of, is asking the jury, is characterizing an, uh, a defense as an excuse and asking the jury to disregard the law on that because out, out of some moral implication. Here, the, the prosecutor's argument was entirely evidence-based. It's not that you should accept that the defendant was intoxicated, but ignore it because we don't think it's a good idea. Instead, his argument was, the defendant is raising these claims of intoxication. What is the evidence at trial to support this? So when he is using the word excuse, he's then saying, he's comparing it to the uh, defendant's opening argument, which uh, opening statement, which says that the, that the defendant was in darkness for five days and then it receded and there was a real, a real moral argument to the defendant's opening statement that the defendant, after he receded from the darkness of this of intoxication, came, in, came and confessed. Um, going. And my point is that I, it's really a pretty simple one, which is that shouldn't uh, the word excuse not have been used, just like the words that Justice uh, Kafka was talking about in terms of the lamb warnings. Wouldn't it be better for not, the prosecutors not to say the word excuse? Excuse has a legal meaning. And he, the judge used excuse in his instructions. Clearly, Salazar suggested, again post-trial, that the word can be misconstrued. Yeah. Um, in the facts of this case, there is no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice, and the Commonwealth would say this was not a preserved issue. Um, because the prosecutor's argument was entirely evidence-based. It kept referring the jury back to the defendant says, 
put this evidence out as an excuse. What do we have, this, what does the evidence say from this? That the defendant is saying he was intoxicated, but he's able to go up to the victim's apartment and steal his items. That the defendant says that he was intoxicated, but 90 minutes before he goes and confesses, he's telling lies. That he's making inculpatory statements to the landlord uh, during the weekend about that he spilled oil in his shed. Um, so where the prosecutor's argument was evidence-based, there was no substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice. I do want to raise one other point. I, I guess more to the point, if next week a prosecutor is giving you her closing argument in preparation to give it and she's using the word excuse in this way, do you tell her it's best left alone? I certainly discussed the discussion we're having right now as well as Commonwealth versus Salazar. I do want to raise one factual issue as to the closing argument on the, on the photographs. To the, to, the suggest, to, to the suggestion that the prosecutor violated a court order by using blow-ups of the autopsy photographs, I asked this court on its plenary review to look at exhibits 114 to 118, which were the, which were the autopsy photographs, that they, they were not blow-ups, that they were the eight by 10 photographs that were admitted into evidence. Yeah, but I'm confused, right? There, there are two different things. The jury's given the pictures, but then there's an instruction that basically the prosecutor's told, don't parade these big pictures around and then they parade the big pictures around, which they shouldn't have done, right? First of all, I don't think it was parade the big pictures around. I thought they. I thought it. I thought at closing he brings out, even though the judge told them not to do it, he brings out the or she brings out the pictures. He big brings blow, out blow ups. The evidence, which was not blow ups. So the prosecution and walking around with the little pictures, or does he eight got eight by ten? And is that what the jury is given eight by tens? Yes. Uh, so yes. he's so he's so then I'm confused why the the judge is instructing why is the judge upset that they're doing this if he's just showing the exact same pictures in the book? I thought they were blow ups. I and, and that's what and Your Honor, I'm happy to file a motion to transfer those photographs so you can look at the judge was very careful about photographs. They were graphic. There were no blow ups, because when we when we go read the transcript again, they're not. We're going to find blow-ups or no blow-ups because so, it's the kind of. It's again, it's a fact statement. I exactly. just want to make sure you're right. So there are some, the two blow-ups of the body, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe are exhibits 63 and either 64 or 65, were the tarp and the tarp partially uncovered at the scene. What happened with the photos is that the final pretrial conference, the judge was very on top of this issue. Mm -hmm. He limited the Commonwealth. Defense counsel asked that there be a booklet for the jurors to look at, mm -hmm. um, which is what, so the judge first said no blow-ups of, of the body. There were lots of blow-ups. And of when other you say blow-ups, what you again? What are you talking? Probably about? about twenty by thirty is what is what they, they what was discussed. When they so the evidence progresses to the scene, they decide that two blow two blow-ups are allowed at the scene. What happens at for the autopsy is what the judge is upset about is that the two pictures that were blow-ups are also included in the booklet, and he says. And the, the pages get flipped so the jury won't see that. But the judge allows the two blow-ups of the scene to come in because he doesn't want to give the jury the booklet quite yet because he doesn't want them flipping through it. The, what was entered in, so the booklet was, exhibit, was H for ID. The autopsy photos were 114 through 118. At closing, the judge is, who has been very on top of this issue, when the prosecutor starts talking about the photos, says, for the record, what are we talking about? So if you look at the prosecutor's closing argument, we'll know exactly what we're talking about. And he's holding up 114, 115, 117. Parading was a defense counsel term. And if you look at how the judge responds, and I suggest this is very important, 
um, the prosecutor protests and says, I, I was showing them to the jury, I wasn't parading them. And the judge cuts it himself. He says, well, a couple of times you were back away from the jury. Another time, he starts to use the word parading, he says, it's better said you walked in front of, in front of the jury. So I suggest parading is a pejorative term that was not ultimately adopted by the judge. What the judge was upset about, what the judge gave a curative instruction about, was, uh, was an argument that he thought he heard that suggested um, that in reg regards to the evidence of self-defense, did the, did, did the, did, did the, um, did the, did the evidence warrant, uh, deserve, did the victim deserve um, what the damage caused in the autopsy photos? And I do suggest you look at the prosecutor's common closing argument. I do not see the word deserve there. I see the word warrant there. That in terms, of, which is a perfectly appropriate for an excessive use of force uh, argument um, and an, an intent argument of, um, of the, the juxtaposition of being poked, the allegation he was poked in the legs um, with a plastic leaf break and the 14 um, or at least 14 um, ax wounds, the multiple ax wounds to the head, the one to the neck and the 11 to um, the back that the victim received. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.